Praise God. Well, stand with me and take your Bible out. I got a few minutes that I can share, share some closing thoughts in just a few minutes. We've had a busy morning. Uh, we've had membership. We've had, and in just a few minutes, we're going to get to baptize some people in the name of Jesus. And so uh, we're excited about it. I would say if, if you are... If you are being baptized at the end of the uh, message this morning, um, I would invite you to come over to my, my, my left, this door over here. If you're not in the prep zone of, of got your outfit on to uh, be baptized in, if you're not wearing what you're going to be baptized in, please, during the service, during my message, you're, you need to, to get, uh, get your clothes on. <laughs> and so, because we're going to go right into it right after I preach. And uh, I think I've got five people we're baptizing this morning. And so, uh, well, I'm excited about it. It's a great day. Would you take your Bible and let's turn to the book of Matthew, Matthew's Gospel. And I, I want to continue to uh, speak a word that God has challenged me with over the past several weeks and months, a couple of months, uh, in thought uh, concerning prayer. And there is, a new, there is a new emphasis. There's a new thing that God is doing. If you, I, and and, and I, 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 I'm careful to make this legalistically as far as just commanding. And I, number one, I'm not going to do that anyway, command. I mean, I can't, that's not my, only God is the one in charge. I can't. I'm just humbly asking, requesting. I know the power of individuals praying, but I'm telling you, when you couple that with a lot more individuals, there is a corporate anointing on that. And I feel the season, it's a new season. There's been prayer around this church all, all the time, but it's a new season. And I get, not everybody's able to. There may be work schedules or distance schedules. I, I, I get that. But if you're able to come, I believe this night is become, going to become one of the most important nights of the week. Um, we meet at 7 o'clock, and we're done usually a little after 8. And um, it's just a time. And, and I asked the team, the group, last Monday night, I said, would you, uh, I humbly ask them to indulge me uh, the direction of what, I don't know exactly everything that's coming. Each week may be different. And um, we may have guest speakers just for, you know, I'm not talking about a full sermon. I'm just talking about a word. Uh, uh, how that, the music will continue to be there at times, different ways. We, we just want to be open to God. But it's more than anything, there's, this house is filled with prayer. And uh, we, we start so, uh, a little bit, before, you know, around 7 o'clock. Uh, some get here earlier. Uh, and then we're usually done a few minutes, a little bit after 8. And so it's an important night. Also, Wednesday night. Uh, we've begun a new uh, series called, um, it's on Colossians. This past Wednesday night was, it, we, it's a video series that's about 10, to, between 10 and 15 minutes that I teach after that. And um, Louis Giglio, uh, past minister from Atlanta, Georgia, powerful, powerful word this past Wednesday night. So we start at uh, Wednesday night at uh, 6.30, and we also have children's and youth ministry on Wednesday night and nursery uh, well, uh, school ministry and youth and children. And so, uh, God bless you. We're going to have a good time. Matthew's Gospel. Would you turn there with me? Matthew chapter 11 and verse number 17. It's a very, very simplistic, very uh, in the respect of just taking it surface level. But there's so much more in this passage than there is if you do just a surface reading of it. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 17. Did I say Matthew? I have, you know what, if I'd read my notes, it says M-A-R, not M-A-T. I'm so sorry. Mark chapter 11 and verse 17. Thank you very much. Y'all see, y'all got to keep me straight. And the scripture says, and as he taught them, he said, is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. Is it not written, God says, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. Father, I, I have seen in the past, but I'm seeing there's just a fresh, fresh move of your spirit um, in this house that is happening these past months and weeks and days and Lord it is nothing that we don't discount of what's happened in the past but God the past is gone you're not there you're here now the past was great 
but past cannot compete with what you're doing now because, Lord, old things are passed away and all things are being made new. And uh, no, yes, you're the same God then as you are now, but, Lord, there's a fresh hunger, a fresh, I believe, a fresh anointing. And, God, we're going to, we're stepping into what all it means about prayer in the house, such as even fasting. We'll be talking about that over the next weeks and there is something that you're specifically saying about a prayer revival. It's a new prayer movement in this place. And I want to give you praise for what you do. And I ask in these next few minutes that you would um, underline some things in our thoughts and, and let us know where you're camping out at on some things and concerning prayer and concerning some answers that have been uh, not withheld, but answers that are coming in your timing. The Lord, just underline that in their life and uh, remind us. Keep on, keep on, keep on praying and believing. And we give you praise and thanks in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. Come on, say it again. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. You may be seated this morning. We talked last Sunday morning about uh, the gospel, and now I'm in Matthew. Go to 21. I knew it was Matthew at some point. Matthew 21 and verse 12 and following. Kind of reveals the same thing as Mark's gospel to some degree. But I'm going to read, I want to read Matthew's gospel. Uh, Matthew 21 and verse number uh, 12. Jesus entered the temple courts. This is the rest of the story. And so Jesus entered the temple courts and he drove out all who were buying and selling there. And notice his actions. He overturned the, the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. And this is what he said. It is written, he said, that in my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. Verse 14 says, the blind and the lame came to him at, at the uh, temple and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did and the children shouted in the temple courts saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. Notice what Jesus said, uh, do you hear what these children are saying? Or they asked him, uh, and this is Jesus' replied. He said, yes, have you never read from the lips of children and infants, you, Lord, have called forth your praise? So in this passage, I believe it reveals some things very clearly, some things that are, I, I guess, could really be called the steps, the uh, progressive steps, you know. When you begin to step up something, you're going somewhere. You're, you know, you're going from where you were to where, where the steps take your, your, your uh, movement. You remember the uh, scripture in, in uh, uh, the Bible where it says that uh, Joshua, under the anointed of God, and God told him, he said, every place the sole of your foot shall tread upon that have a get begin you. He was not talking about stepping in place. He was talking about a movement. I mean, understand, prayer is a movement. Prayer takes you somewhere. There are things that God adds alongside of that while we're praying that brings revelation and brings the word. I, certainly, guys, I, and I don't want, I, I'm not taking a poll here. I'm not going to ask for that. I'm not, no, I'm not excusing a lack of prayer. But at the same time, I don't want you to feel that if you pray a certain amount of time, then God's going to answer a certain way. There's, we're not talking about a time factor. We're talking about God says that you don't ever stop praying. He says pray without ceasing, didn't he? And so it's not a point that, well, if I don't pray two hours a day, then, then I'm not in the will of God. That, that's not even scriptural. Now, there are people that pray hours a day, and, and for them, that is uh, scriptural or biblical because God has blessed them with, with the uh, 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 ability or intercession to pray. But I want to tell you, and I want you to hear this. I, I've, I, I, I just got through reading a book about leveling the praying field that the author is our general secretary of the Assemblies of God National Office. And she wrote a book called On Prayer and, and how she, uh, God, uh, established a prayer ministry in her and a prayer life. And so she's, but her book was leveling the praying field, basically saying that every one of us can pray. Prayer is not just for the spiritual elite. Let me tell you, to say there's a spiritual elite is not true. There, I mean, nobody is elite in the house of God. I don't care if you've been saved two days or two years or decades. There's no one. Now, are there those that have a, 
uh, a better a fluency with God in the respect, not that they have a special line between them and God, but they have, have uh, been faithful and disciplined in their prayer life, and is there a close relationship? Yes, I get that, because the longer you spend time with someone, the more you know that person, right? Same thing with God. The more we spend time with him, the more we know him. But folks, prayer does not get you saved. If you ask your Lord to come into your heart when you prayed that prayer, he did, not because necessarily our prayer was so good, it's because he's so good. And so the issue is not comparing yourself to others. The issue is, are you praying? Are, you di- are we disciplining, disciplining ourselves to pray and seek the face of God. It's just like a husband and wife that doesn't spend time together. They lose that closeness. Let me tell you, you, you know, you've got to spend time together. Say, well, uh, I'm, uh, I, I can't find time. Let me tell you, time is not found. Time is made. This past week, and God is, and I'm just, I'm just throughout this, I want to try to be, uh, transparent on what God's bringing me because I believe it would be uh, something that would, would help you guys because it, it's happening to me. And I told you about three weeks ago when I, I began this series on prayer revival that there's some things it has to start with me because if it doesn't start with me, it's not going to infiltrate throughout the church. I know what God is saying to me, and I know that's why God has raised my thinking up and got me into a new realm, a new, uh, not that I'm didn't believe in a prayer before, but there's something different that God is saying. The vision is starting with me. I talked about Joel chapter 2, about the priest weeping between the porch and the altar. And so I've, this past week, there was something different happened in my life. Even this week, I was closing out. I was reading that book on Tuesday, and, and it's like the Lord just quickly brought uh, a prayer meeting to my thoughts. I had been invited over the years, different times, uh, d- a couple of different guys to a pastor's prayer time. They meet every Tuesday at at uh, a particular any particular church, uh, uh, different churches in their group, and and they meet from one o'clock to one to two every Tuesday. And I wasn't, th- and all of a sudden, boom! It was just like that clear. And I knew what I was supposed to do, so I, I texted the guy, one of the ministers, and uh, Mark Cook. And um, also Stafford Floyd comes to this as well, and a, a dear friend of mine, and uh, I uh, known over many many days over the years. We've I, he's just a great guy and a great uh, uh, son of the living God, and uh, and so I just felt, hey, I, Mark, uh, when when are you guys praying? He, uh, he said today, one o'clock. He said, well, is it okay with you? I'd like to come. He sent back, yes, excellent. I, I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know what was that that day we had. Um, Mark's uh, a couple of friends of his, they're missionaries, and they're missionary to the Uyghur people, and uh, they have been in the news, my understanding, and and I've seen some of the things that are being basically persecuted. Uh, Now, they are trying for, uh, ultimately, um, to teach the gospel. Now, most, the biggest population amount of them, it's in China area, and they are, they have, uh, most of them, I want to say it's like 95% are Muslim. And so this particular missionary there has been working for 30 plus years with the Uyghurs. And it's not spelled with a W. It's like it starts with a U. And don't ask me. I can't spell it right now. But it was, it was phenomenal. It come to find out who is not necessarily Assemblies of God. And, that, and who cares? Uh, but he said our ministry is working with several denominations, fellowships, including the Assemblies of God. So our, our AG missionaries are working with him. Yeah, you know, I, I thought this was so cool. So that was a God thing, hearing that, and they're, they're getting the gospel translated into the Uyghur uh, uh, ability so they can, they can read it. And, uh, and they're seeing some, uh, some roads, stepping through some things that God is doing some great things. And then, so we prayed over them. And then Mark said, okay, Charles, what is, what's going on with you? What, what is, what's happening? Uh, so I had to talk then. <laughs> And I began to share what God was speaking to me. And they said, okay, we want you to sit down right here. We're going to pray over you. I'm telling you, they started praying in tongues, started praying over me and laying hands on me, anointing me. Holy Ghost just 
powerfully just fell in that room, started prophesying on what is coming, not just to me, but in this church. And, and it just, and the prophetic word lined up with, yes, the word of God, but also what God has already been speaking, some things he's speaking to me. Let me tell you, God's got a plan that he's working. And so I said, yeah, I'll, I'll be there on Tuesdays now. <laughs> and so I'm establishing, I'm not necessarily got it on calendar yet, but there's like a prayer appointments that God is establishing in me. Prayer is time is not found. Prayer time is made because you understand, just as I do, if you don't set things on your calendar that you come back to, that you do, you know there's going to be other things that will vie for that attention. Are you with me this morning? So there's progressive steps. We talked about it last week. There's the house of purity. And we talked about being broken and finding people that we can be accountable to in our life. And, uh, the, and then ultimately the prayer of a righteous man availeth much. But secondly, it's where I want to be at this morning. And none of these are as long at all. I preached one whole service on that last week. So I'm not going to be on that today or that whole time. But secondly, what about the people of the house of prayer? Now, who is that? Now, yes, we would quickly say it's us. But... God said there was something more. Mark's gospel, chapter eleven, seventeen. it says, for all nations. It says, this is the house of prayer. Everybody say it with me. For all nations. The house of prayer is for who? All nations. All nations. Now, what does that mean? Mark, Matthew's gospel, 21, 14 says, the blind and the lame came to him at the temple and he healed them. So in other words, this is what I believe it's speaking to, not just the nations as a whole, but also people that need to know Jesus Christ, the house, the place that God meets us in, not just uh, internally, but also corporately, publicly. It's got to be a place. It has to be a place where the broken, the addicted, the hurting can come in and feel at home and worship and get to know Jesus Christ. It's not a place. Let me tell you, because that's a Pharisee thing. The house of prayer is not a place for the whole only. It's a place for the sick. And I believe and I know prayer changes things. Prayer changes sickness into wholeness. Prayer changes addiction into freedom. Prayer changes blind into seeing once again. Prayer will change things in this house. Jesus told a story about two people praying in the temple in Luke's gospel, chapter 18 and verse 9 and following. It says, Jesus told the story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and, and scorned everyone else. And it says, two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee and the other was a despised tax collector. And the Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. He said, I thank you, God, that I am not like a sinner or everyone else. And basically saying, I'm not like this publican. How many would you feel pretty good about somebody praying by you and saying, I'm glad, God, I'm not like them? You know, there was something not, not kosher about that. He said, for I don't cheat, I don't sin, and I don't commit adultery. And I'm certainly not like that tax collector. He said, and he was, just, he was just translating to God his piousness and how good he was. He said, I fast twice a week and I give you a tenth of my income. But the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. And instead he beat his chest in sorrow saying, oh God, be merciful to me for I'm a sinner. God said, I tell you this, sinner, not the Pharisee, return home justified before God. And here's the scripture, for those who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. He said that two men went up to the temple to pray, a Pharisee and a publican. You cannot get anybody further diametrically opposed and apart than these two men were. Pharisee was at the top of his game. At, he was a religious leader. The publican was at the bottom. His, and this parable wasn't about you know, politically about politicians or publicans and sinners. Publicans were, uh, or religious leaders, I should say as well. Publicans were right down there with the sinners. Pharisee was at the top. Supposedly the most, accept supposedly because of his position, the one most acceptable to God. And, and he went into the temple to pray and he had access, because he had access to the temple. 
And he brought the appointed sacrifice. And, and as he stood and prayed, his priest was yonder in the holy place, putting incense on the altar. And this old Pharisee had it made. The tax collector, he was the despise of that society, the lowest, the lowliest. And he came to Jesus in knowing of his own sinfulness, but he knew where grace and mercy could be found. Let me tell you, this world needs to know there's grace found at Charleston First Assembly of God and other places that know Jesus Christ. There's grace in the church. Get rid of the pharisaical ideas that we're better than anybody else. There's grace in the house. He was despised, dejected, but he knew where grace and mercy was. See, understand the Pharisee didn't go to the temple to pray to God, but to announce to all within earshot how good he was. Basically, he was praying to himself because God wasn't listening. The tax collector went recognizing his sin and begging for mercy. Let me tell you, folks, self-righteousness is dangerous. It leads to pride and causes people to despise others and prevents them or from hearing anything from God. The tax collector's prayer should be our prayer because we all need God's mercy every day. Let me challenge you, don't let pride in your achievements cut you off from God because that is exactly what will take place. There's not one of us in this house better than, than, our, than anybody else because God says, let he that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. No matter how long you've been saved, you still need the grace of Jesus Christ to get you through the next moment. And so a house of prayer is a house that prays for God to touch people through that house. It said it's for all nations. I don't, I'm telling you guys, this house isn't for the religious correct. This house is for th those that don't know nothing else but that Jesus is their source. Now, we want to grow in our walk with God, but never to the point of religious pride that think we've got it all made. Yeah, you may have some good days and there may be some things going great, but don't ever think that they can't change just in a moment's time. You don't just need God on the days when it's going bad. Honey, you need God on the days it's going good to keep you humble before him. A house of prayer is a house for all nations, all people. Thirdly, a house of prayer is a place of power. Say it with me. A house of prayer is a place of power. Verse 14 says, he healed them. He healed them. How many believe praying to God brings healing? He healed them. Prayer dramatically changes lives in ministry. To have God's presence, we have to pray. Prayer and praise creates an atmosphere for the presence of God. When I pray, God says he'll listen. When I pray, he said, if my people that are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and, and, and turn for their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I'll heal their land. In order to see God's power, you've got to pray. You can't just hang on to the coattails of, of generations before you. If you want to and your generation wants to see the power of God, we all got to seek God and pray. In order to see God's power, we have to pray. God says in verse 15 of 2 Chronicles 7, Now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. I have chosen and consecrated this temple so that my name may be there forever. My, are, my eyes and my heart will always be there. Let me tell you, his name represents who he is. His name represents his characteristics, who he is, his nature, his power, and everything else. God says, when you pray, my name will be there. Let me say that again. God says in this house, when we pray, the name of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords will be here. Every time you call upon the name of the Lord, the name of the Lord will be here and reside in this place. The name. Come on, shout the name with me. Jesus. Come on, shout it out. Jesus. 
God is saying to us this morning, the Lord, El Roy, the God who sees me, Yahweh will be here. Elohim, which is the God of mine, he will be here. Jehovah Shammah, the God who is present. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord, our healer. Jehovah Sekinu, the Lord, our righteousness. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, our provider. Jehovah Nissi, the Lord, our banner. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord, our peace. Jehovah Sh- uh, Sebioth, the Lord of hosts. God, El Elyon, the Most High God, and El Shaddai. How many know who the El Shaddai is? He is God Almighty. When you speak the name and pray, God says, my name. Come on, you ought to lift your hands and just praise him. Praise the name of God with me this morning. Come on, team, I want to ask you to come. When the presence of God is in the house, not because you feel it, but because you know it. We've t- tempered ourselves. We want to feel something. Let me tell you, stop seeking for a feeling and know the fact. When I show up, God is here because he's in me. God is in you. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. You don't have to praise the power down. The power is already down. You don't have to do, do something great and stupendous. God has already done something great. He forgave us of our sins. And he wants to meet with us. The prayer, though of his people, is what God says he will come upon. When the presence of God is in the house, his power is in the house. See, Charles Simpson, he wrote a book. He said in his book on prayer, he said, when we acknowledge God and his presence, amazing things happen. How many is ready to see those amazing things happen in your life? He says in Jeremiah 33, 3, call to me and I will answer you. Somebody ought to stand up and start calling upon the Lord. (laughs) Call to me and I will answer. That was your cue to stand, by the way. Uh, Call to me and I'll answer. You know, it's like... Did you see anything there where you said you got to be perfect, got to have it all squared away, got to have it all worked out, uh, everything is going to be uptight and upright, and your, everything is just great. No, he said, call to me and I'll answer. It's not for the spiritually elite. It's for the spiritually hungry. God doesn't come down because I'm that good. That, that would never happen. God comes because he is good and I'm hungry. As the deer pants after the water, so my soul longs after you. God told Jeremiah, is anything too hard for me? He's the one who was revealed in the Christ, who walked on water. He cast out evil spirits. He healed the sick. He turned water into wine. He fed thousands with five loaves and two fish. He's the one who raised the dead and was himself raised from the dead. When we pray, we're asking and talking to this God through Jesus Christ who ever lives to make intercession for us. Unfortunately, as we all know, we've all allowed other things to rob us of our fellowship with God and the God of the Bible and the rewards of diligently seeking Him. Dick Eastman, a giant on prayer, he made a statement. He said it this way. He said, some things happen when I pray that do not happen if I don't pray. Guys, I I humbly, I humbly call on this church to go back to prayer. Every day. Every day spend time reading your word and get back to prayer. I call on you to be, have a fresh devotion to him. To the one that says, my house should be called a house of prayer. He said in his word, the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. I want you to notice something in that same passage, chapter 5 of James. It says, Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. And he prayed and the heavens gave rain and the earth produced the crops. See, sometimes the answer to your prayer doesn't happen the moment you pray. 
I believe God answers every time we pray, but it's not always conducive to my circumstances at the moment. Sometimes the answer may be delayed in what my thinking is. It's not delayed on God's part. It's maybe my time schedule is delayed. He told Ahab, get ready. It's about to rain. (laughs) What kind of prayers are you praying? If you were praying and listening to yourself pray, what would you say about your prayers? Do you believe what you're praying or or what you're asking? Are you passionate in your prayers? Are you praying with a level of faith that you know deep inside that God is listening and you know the answer is on the way? Let me tell you, don't ever forget prayer matters to God. Your prayers. And in some sense, the word without the ability to rest upon us or in our prayers, prayer changes things and it's on His ability. Your prayers change the course of activity deep inside your life. And prayer stops the activity of the enemy from destroying your life. He says it simply as this, whatever we ask believing, we shall receive. Can I tell you, basically, when you pray, you, you've got to add, uh, add faith into that. Faith sees the invisible. Faith hears the inaudible. And faith does the impossible. Let me say it again. Faith, when you're praying, faith sees the invisible. Faith, it hears the inaudible, and faith does the impossible. In other words, God says pray fervently. The Bible says Elijah prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And the Bible says he was just like us. Elijah, the major prophet, was just like us. Now, what does that mean? In the Greek, it simply means... He was made of the same stuff we are. Anybody feel weak at times? Anybody that don't feel like praying at times? That was Elijah. He was made of the same stuff. Here it is, guys. When ordinary people call on God, powerful things happen. Lastly, and I'm done. We're going to do this together. A house of prayer and of power will be transformed into a house of praise. When the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did, the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the Son of God, they were indignant. They said, do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. He said, yes. Have you never heard or never read from the lips of children and infants, Lord, you have called forth your praise. God's house of prayer will turn into a house of praise. Any prayers, any prayers in the house that could just lift your hands up to the Lord and begin to shout unto God and praise Him this morning. Come on, just vocally. Come on, you shout at your ball team. Why don't you shout unto God and tell Him how good He is, how awesome He is. God inhabits the praise of his people. Let me tell you, church, we need a prayer revival. We need a revival of praise. We need a revival of prayer. We need a revival of his presence this morning. Lord, I praise you. Lord, I praise you today. Oh, God. God, be the center of our hearts. Be the center of this church. It's all about you, Jesus. Heads are bowed just for a moment. You may be in the place this morning, you've come in with the idea that you know you're not ready to see Jesus, but you were drawn into this house for some reason today. You're in the right place. For one, you're in a place that we believe that God can welcome and God can change any life. I know what I'm talking about. I've read it. I've experienced it. God says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So my friend, my dear friend today, the peace that you're looking for, it's found in Him. It's in His presence. And I want you to know whether you're watching by way of live cast right now or you're live here in this building, Jesus is in this room.
to save you. He said, Pastor, I, I want that. I'm not sure if I can do it. Let me tell you, it's not what you can do. It's what Jesus can do in you. He said, Pastor, today, that's me. Would you pray with me? If that's you, you said, Pastor, I'm ready to give my heart to the Lord. I know I'm not ready, but I know from this moment on, I've, there's got to be a change. So I'm going to ask you to do one simple thing. I'm not going to ask you to join the church. Salvation, joining the church is two different things. Salvation is simply asking God upon your repentance of your sins to him, confessing that to him, him saying, I release you from your sins. You're forgiven. There's no more condemnation. You say, Pastor, that's me. Would you pray with me? That's you. Would you slip a hand up just real quick, put it right back down. That's all I'm going to do, and I'm going to pray. Yes. Thank you, buddy. I see your hand back in the back. Yes. Yes, thank you. God bless you. Yeah. Your hand's going up. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Come on. It's not a time to be putting this off. The day is the day of salvation. Come on. Come on. Be bold in the Lord. Come on. If, you, if you'll be bold for these next few moments, God's going to be bold towards you and show you something that you have never seen in your life. Anybody else? Say, Pastor, all I'm asking is just, just say, yes, I, I, I need Jesus in my life. I want to give my heart to Jesus. I, I'm hanging on just for a moment. I'm just, just hanging. If you're, if you're uh, by way of live cast, there's a button now that you'll see come up on your screen while you're watching this that says simply, I'm raising my hand with those here, and we'll know it. And you can pray with us wherever you're at, whatever you're doing right now, you can pray with us right now as well. Someone else? Praise God. Come on. I want us all to pray together. We're gonna, I don't care if you believe or not, we're going to all pray this prayer. If you're saved, you save, this is just a good recommitment prayer. Let's all pray it together. Say, Jesus, I need you. Would you come into my life? Forgive me of every sin. I need your peace. But I need your presence. Thank you, Lord, for loving me. I repent and turn from every sin. And I receive your love. In your name I pray. In your name I pray. Would you say amen? amen? Can we just celebrate that today? Amen. Hallelujah.